Now for today's program, it is my honor to briefly introduce all of our distinguished guests. Dr. Dorothy Cantor has been a volunteer for the National Parks Conservation Association for 34 years, serving on the Board of Trustees from 1988 to 1997. She is currently the president of the Rosenwald Park Campaign, which is working to create the multi-site Julius Rosenwald and Rosenwald Schools National Historical Park. Dorothy is also on the board of the Capitol Jewish Museum in Washington, D.C., and served on the board of the Shenandoah National Park Trust. Marion Coleman, a former student of the Noble Hill School in the early 1950s, is the great-granddaughter of Mr. Webster Wheeler, chief builder of the Rosenwald School in 1923 in Cassville, Georgia, which is located about 57 miles north of Atlanta. Once the restored school became the Noble Hill Wheeler Memorial Center, Marion, an educator, served as its curator for 21 years. Since retiring, she now serves as a Noble Hill Center volunteer and is a member of the Noble Hill Wheeler Foundation Board. Valerie Coleman first served as a regular volunteer at the Noble Hill Memorial Center alongside her aunt, Marion Coleman, before becoming the lead curator in 2017. Valerie is the great-great-granddaughter of Webster Wheeler, the chief contractor of the Noble Hill School. Stephanie Deutsch is the author of the book, You Need a Schoolhouse, Booker T. Washington, Julius Rosenwald, and the Building of Schools for the Segregated South. And she has visited and spoken at restored Rosenwald schools across the South. She is a board member of the Rosenwald Park Campaign. Stephanie's husband, David, is a great-grandson of Julius Rosenwald. Andrew Feiler is a photographer and an author. Having grown up Jewish in Savannah, he has been shaped by the rich complexities of the American South. His book, A Better Life for Their Children, Julius Rosenwald, Booker T. Washington, and the 4,978 Schools That Changed America, has won many awards, including first place for documentary book from the 2022 International Photography Awards. His photographs have been instrumental in the campaign to create a new U.S. National Historical Park and even inspired the composition of a symphony. Andrew's prints and photographs have been displayed in galleries and museums around the country, including civil rights museums in Memphis, Atlanta, and Greensboro, North Carolina, as well as the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, D.C. Filmmaker Aviva Kempner has been making award-winning documentaries about underknown Jewish heroes for over 40 years. Some of her many documentaries include The Life and Times of Hank Greenberg, Partisans of Vilna, as well as Rosenwald, a documentary on the incredible story of how businessman and philanthropist Julius Rosenwald joined the African-American communities in the South to build schools during the early part of the 20th century. Aviva who founded the Washington, D.C. Jewish Film Festival, is the recipient of many awards, including a Guggenheim Fellowship, the D.C. Mayor's Art Award, and the Moment Magazine Creativity Award. It is my honor to now turn the program over to Dorothy Cantor. Today's program is the story of two men and nearly 5,000 African-American communities and the partnerships they formed to increase education for African-Americans in the segregated South. The program also addresses journeys, both of a century ago and those of today's participants. The first man, Booker T. Washington, was born enslaved in Virginia in 1856 and thirsted for education. He walked across Virginia to reach the Hampton Agricultural and Industrial School, where he worked in return for the education he desperately wanted. Becoming highly educated, Washington went on to found Tuskegee Institute, now the Tuskegee in University, in rural Alabama, and built that institution into a prestigious center for higher education for African American students. He was nationally known and committed for many years to building schools in the rural South for African-American children. The other man, Julius Rosenwald, born in 1862 in Springfield, Illinois, the son of German Jewish immigrants, left high school early to learn the clothing trade in New York City. While living a comfortable life in Chicago, manufacturing men's suits, he got an extremely lucky break in 1895 
a chance to buy into the recently founded Sears Roebuck and Company. Between Richard Sears' exceptional marketing skills and Rosenwald's business acumen, Sears Roebuck became the retailing powerhouse of the early 20th century. Rosenwald used his enormous wealth to help others, particularly African-Americans, to lead a better life. The two men met in 1911 in Chicago and embarked upon a project that had extraordinary impact on the lives of hundreds of thousands of African-American students and their families throughout the South. Today, you will hear first from Stephanie Deutsch about her journey that led to her book, The Partnership of Julius Rosenwald and Booker T. Washington, and the partnerships with the African-American communities that brought about these historical changes. You will then hear from Marion Coleman and her niece, Valerie Coleman, about the history of one Rosenwald school in Georgia, how members of the family built it a century ago, were educated in it, came to own it, and eventually to restore it and convert it into the vibrant Memorial Center that it is today. Next, Andrew Filer will take us on his journey across 15 states to photograph and commemorate Rosenwald schools and what they have meant to the nation and to him. Our cleanup hitter, Aviva Kempner, and I chose that term because Aviva is a big fan of baseball. And uh, she, one of her documentaries, as you heard, was about Hank Greenberg. And before the program, she let us know that she has just recently been appointed to the advisory board of, Israeli, of the Israeli Basque, baseball team. So congratulations, Aviva. Aviva will relate how she connected to Julius Rosenwald and her journey to film the documentary Rosenwald and how another educational program of the Julius Rosenwald Fund, the fellowship program, also contributed to the nation's history. After their introductory remarks, the panelists will engage in a conversation about the history-changing partnerships and their own intersecting journeys to appreciate and convey these partnerships. The discussion will include some information on the campaign to create the Julius Rosenwald and Rosenwald Schools National Historical Park that will one day become part of our nation's continuing journey towards racial harmony. So with that, Stephanie, please begin. Thank you, Dorothy. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you all. So my journey began about 20 years ago when I was looking to reinvent myself after being home raising children and also doing bits of writing. Having grown up, reading lots of biographies, I particularly wanted to write the story of a life. And at some point, one of my husband's cousins suggested a book about Julius Rosenwald. As you heard, I had married into the extended Rosenwald family. My husband is a great grandson. Initially, though, the idea of writing about Rosenwald didn't have much appeal for me. I thought a businessman's life, I don't know, that lacks drama. I questioned my ability to make it interesting. But then I began doing research, and I found something that very much captured my interest. And that was Rosenwald's relationship with Booker T. Washington and the extraordinary school building partnership to which it led. Like most people, I suspect, like many people, I am quite sure, I was familiar with the name Booker T. Washington, but I actually knew very little about this remarkable man or the backdrop against which he grew up and became so extraordinarily well known. I really hadn't appreciated his life story, so movingly captured in Up From Slavery, his autobiography, or the brutality of the times in which he was working to bring some measure of opportunity and dignity to African Americans. My timing, as it turned out, was good. In the year 2002, just as I was digging into my research, the National Trust for Historic Preservation named the Rosenwald Schools as a group to its annual list of most endangered historic sites in America, highlighting the effort that was ongoing in many places across the South to document remaining schools and in many cases preserve them, and certainly right here in Georgia. 
So I visited Chicago where Peter Askely, Rosenwald's grandson, and thus my husband's cousin, was gracious to me. He and I went together to Sears headquarters and looked at old magazines and documents. I went to the University of Chicago Library and dove into Rosenwald's correspondence there. Went to the archives at the Chicago Museum of Science and Industry, to which Rosenwald had given the founding donation. And traveled to Tuskegee to see their holdings of photographs and letters, to visit Booker T. Washington's beautiful home, the Oaks, and to soak up the feel of that historic campus. In New Orleans, thanks to another Rosenwald cousin, I spent a happy day in the attic of Longview, the regal home of Rosenwald's daughter, Edith, reading family correspondence that was stored there. And I visited my first Rosenwald school, Scrabble School in Rappahannock County, Virginia, near where I live in Washington, DC. And slowly over this time, my book emerged, not as a biography of Rosenwald, that had been ably done by Peter Askely, but as a dual biography of two men from very different backgrounds, meeting, as Dorothy said, in May of 1911 in Chicago, and discovering a shared concern for extending educational opportunity to Southern Black children. Julius Rosenwald and Booker T. Washington shared a trait, which was that they were both highly capable, practical men. Rosenwald ran one of the nation's largest and successful businesses, Sears Roebuck, and Washington was known not just nationally, but internationally as the founder of Tuskegee and an eloquent spokesman for advancing the cause of educational opportunity for African-Americans. These two men shared a passion for and an ability to get things done. Thanks to Washington's deep connection to Southern communities, they were able to build on the willingness that was already there among Black people to dig deep, make sacrifices, and contribute not just money, but land, labor, and expertise to create the schoolhouses and enhanced education they so passionately desired. So this remarkable three-way partnership that we know as Rosenwald Schools was born. Seed money donated by the Chicago philanthropist, an equivalent or sometimes greater amount raised by the communities the schools would benefit, and significant support from the local jurisdictions pulled into meeting their responsibilities towards their dramatically underserved Black populations. These were public schools. By the time the program closed in 1932, almost 5,000 Southern communities had taken advantage of it to obtain schoolhouses. So in the year 2012, a year after my book came out, I was in Atlanta and I had the opportunity to visit Noble Hill with a reporter from CNN. <clears throat> it was one of the first restored schools I had seen, and I was, of course, taken with its iconic look, the meaningful displays inside, and the delightfully welcoming curator, Marion Coleman. During, that course of, during the course of that visit, the reporter asked me what had been my big takeaway from the research I had done for my book. Well, it was a question I had never been asked before in quite that way, but it only took me a minute to come up with the answer. I told her that what I had gotten from researching and writing my book was enhanced respect and admiration for people like the African-American residents of Bartow County, Georgia, who a hundred years ago, despite the enslavement of their ancestors and the harsh reality of their present circumstances, did not lose faith in their country, or in the power of education to change not just individual lives, but social and political realities. Those were troubled, turbulent, and often desperately discouraging times. And yet people like Marion Coleman's forebears and Valerie's forebears were willing and able to imagine something different and to make it happen. That was my big takeaway. And it's a message I come back to often. It's a story I think deserves to be more widely known and will, I hope, someday be commemorated in a national park. Thank you, Stephanie. Now we'll hear from Marion Coleman and Valerie, Val, Val, oh, sorry, Valerie, Valerie Coleman about the Noble Hill School and its conversion to the Noble Hill Wheeler Memorial Center. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Kent. 
I'm happy to be here and to uh, give a little uh, short uh, and synopsis of the Noah Hill Wheel Memorial Center when it first began. A Rosenwald School for Black Children was, in, uh, was erected in Bartow County, Cassville community in 1923. No, the Noble Hill School, officially named, was Casper Colored School. We're not sure where the name Noble Hill came from, but Dr. Wheeler, who I worked with when I first started here at Noble Hill, she told me that it was a noble idea and it was on a hill. So I'll tell everybody it was a noble idea. Okay, the leadership team behind the building of the Rosenwald School was Professor and Mrs. C.W. Williams from Atlanta, Georgia, who served as the educational leaders of the new school from 1924 to 1927. The school was built with substantial support from the Rosenwald Fund, as well as from local Black citizens. The school was the first school in Northwest Georgia to be built with Rosenwald matching funds. It was the first in Bartow County to be built by a standard plan for Black students. The cost of the building was $2,036.35. Think of what you could build for that today. <laughs> <laughs> and the $700 of that was paid by the Rosenwald Fund. $665.31 was raised by the citizens in the community, and $275 was donated by the Bartow County Board of Education, and $400, $400 was loaned by the Bartow County Education Board of Education. The key builders of the school were Mr. Webster Wheeler, who was a farmer and carpenter most of his life, and his, it was assisted by his son, Bethel Wheeler, and Danny Harris, a farmer who was a carpenter, he had carpenter skills, who served as a trustee of the school. Many citizens of both races volunteered materials and labor. The school was a wooden building petitioned with a four foot divider to house grades one, two, and three on one side and grades four through seven on the other side. Wooden benches were used for seating students at each work table. The building was heated by a wood-burning pot-bellied stove. The books were bought by the parents and some came from uh, neighboring white schools after they had finished with them. There was no electricity and studying had to be done by daylight. It had, it, in bad weather, the teachers would send the pupils home at noon. The main subjects taught were English, reading, arithmetic, and geography. In addition to organizing the first PTA meeting, Mrs. Joanna Hamilton, a school teacher in Hampton, Georgia, gave the students their first lesson in art and crafts by teaching them to make hats from corn shucks. Noble Hill School had 20 teachers from 1924 to 1955. A, view of the, a few of the teachers had long years of tenure as Mrs. Mary Ellen Williams Beavers. For 24 years, she taught. And Mrs. Ava L. King, she taught 10 years. She also served as principal while others worked for short periods of time as Mrs. Sarah Wings White, who was Dr. Susan Wheeler's sister, and Mrs. Catherine Beasley, Mrs. Minnie Ruth Smith, the, and Professor Matthew Sloan, who served as principal of the school prior to World War II when he went into service. He is particularly remembered for bringing basketball to the school. Many of the early Black schools were either started by churches or were on church grounds. The school was the hub of cultural activity and education. Some other schools located in Bartow County at this time were Adasville, Pine Log, Pine Grove, 
Kingston, Stylesboro, Emerson, and Cartersville in 1951. And after, in 1951, after they had to be condemned, the schools in Mission and the school in Sugar Valley, or Pleasant Grove, as it was called, were consolidated into Noble Hill, these two schools. And at that time, the enrollment was nearly 100 students. This led to an army barracks being placed on the school grounds as it had to house some of the students. This began the first system transportation for black children in Bartow County. For more than 30 years, Noble Hill School educated the black children of Cassville and Bartow County. For many years, Noble Hill was a flagship of educational facility for black children in Bartow County. The school was abandoned in 1955 when all schools for black students in Bartow County were consolidated to form the Bartow Elementary School. The building was sold to the New Hope Baptist Church located just below the school and later sold to Mr. Bethel Wheeler's son of Mr. Webster Wheeler, who was the builder of the original structure who used the building, Mr. Bethel Wheeler used the building during his time for storage and paper building. The idea of the project to restore Noble Hill School after 25 years was to the Noble Hill Wheel Memorial Center became, and it began in 1982 with Dr. Susan Wheeler showing the building to Dr. Carol Merritt of the Department of National Resource Preservation Section and later advanced in 1983 by Justice Robert Benham because of his interest in the history of the area. In 1983, sporadic discussions led to the organization of a group who were to investigate the possibility of securing the Noble Hill School for restoration. Contact was made with the owner, Mrs. Bertha Wheeler, who was the wife of Bertha Wheeler. And she decided in 1984 to donate the site to be used as a heritage center in memory of her father-in-law, Mr. Webster Wheeler, and her husband, Mr. Bethel Wheeler. Mrs. Wheeler's home became the meeting place for the restoration committee. Soon rubbish was cleared from the building by committee members and other volunteers. After the site was elevated, the approved, it was evaluated and approved for restoration by the historic preservation section. Contact was made with the Coosa Valley RDC and their historic preservation planner joined in the restoration effort. The preservation section sent a historian and an architect to examine the structure. They decided that the structure was worthy of restoration and set guidelines. In 1985, fundraising activities went into full swing with former students, friends, and the business community involved in the effort. This gave us the first public money for restoration. Committee members also had given monies for communication purposes, and they also had made pledges. In 1987, the Noble Hill Center was placed on the National Register of Historic Places in the historic, as a historic site on December 17, 1989. The center was open to the public, a climax of six years of restoration work. The center now serves as a heritage museum and basically reflects black culture of Bartow County, including historical information on all schools for blacks from the early 1900s, the artifacts and pictorial resources of the community and its lifestyles. There are videos and written materials, all are there to, all are here to utilize, to depict the development and operation of the first Noble Hill School. The cost for the development of the center has been estimated at 
over $200,000. The funding sources are former students and friends in the community, local government and corporate community, state and federal grants. The project on a hill stands as a beacon in light to those who have an interest in ma majority culture and its contribution to this area in Northwest Georgia. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm very excited to be with you all tonight. And I wanted to give you all, um, show you one of our artifacts that we received back in 2019. It's a wonderful quilt that we house here that we show our, our guests. And I wanted to give a shout out to the quilt artist. Her name is Teresa Cook. Uh, she, she is a local and faithful donor to Noble Hill. Um, and I gave her a tour one day and she decided to uh, give Noble Hill with a wonderful uh, handmade quilt and entered it into O.V. Brantley's quilt show uh, down in Atlanta, Georgia. And it actually won an honorable mention ribbon. So um, we were very excited about that. And um, she just briefly put um, the Noble Hill history um, on a quilt uh, with some of our influential people. And of course there's more people, but we couldn't add everyone. So uh, we put like our main uh, influential people in the community that um, helped with the, this vision. So I'm gonna briefly start. Um, we have Julius Rosenwald and Booker T. Washington. Together they established, developed and implemented the Rosenwald School funding concept. And then we have Mr. Webster Wheeler. He, he, he is my great-great-grandfather and also the general contractor and first trustee. And we have the teachers, the first educators below, C.W. and Myra Williams. Um, and then we have Dr. Susie, I mean, Bertha and Bethel Wheeler, excuse me. They donated the property for the Heritage Center Museum in memory of, of her father-in-law and husband. Then we have Dr. Susie Weens Wheeler and former Supreme Court Justice Robert Benham. They were our visionaries and collaborators of the Restoration Project in 1983. And the Heritage Museum opened in 1989. And then to my far right, we have Mr. Alan Beavers, educator, Willie Walford, uh, entrepreneur, Mr. Winston Strickland, also an entre entrepreneur, excuse me. And uh, these were our first foundation board trustees. And then we have also Joy Hill Watson, one of our beloved curators. She was here from 2016 to 2017. Cheryl Smith, our former, found, former foundation board president from 2012 to 2013. And then here today, we have our current uh, foundation board president, Ms. Uh, Pastor Louise Young Harris, myself, and my Aunt Marion, who still serves on our foundation board. Um, and we also, as you can see on the quilt, we have the um, marker there and then the beautiful school uh, that's in the center. And so um, the, when we have visitors and we give tours, we show this piece and it's a beloved uh, piece um, uh, in our community and every, everyone is is ecstatic about this piece and they always want to take pictures and we's like yeah you know share it with others uh and bring them back with you next time <laughs> so um this quilt was named a noble idea set upon a hill um and um what we offer here at noble hill uh, the center provides today as a museum uh, a, ref a reflection of Black culture in the, this area from the late 1800s to the present, a small resource library, and information on education for Black children from 1923 to 1955, religious, economic, social, and civic activities from the early 1900s. 
a facility which can be used for meetings, lunches, tours, reunions, class training, small weddings, reception showers, and picnics, et cetera. And currently we are um, working on our land expansion project. Um, that was one of Dr. Susie Wheeler's uh, vision for us to expand. So um, we are very excited uh, about that, that we're growing and expanding. And we hope to share um, a lot of what we, we're doing at a later date. Um, but we want you all to, when you have time to come out and visit, we're open Tuesday through uh, Saturday from nine to four. If you're in the area, please stop by um, so we can share uh, our history and legacy here. Um, and I call, I call uh, Noble Hill our hidden jewel in the woods. So come and check out our hidden jewel in the woods. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marion and Valerie. Noble Hill is one of the Rosenwald schools where the family for multiple generations has been associated with the schools. Andrew is gonna to talk to you now about his journey and he will talk about at least several other families that have been closely associated with their schools. Andrew, please. Thank you. I am going to uh, briefly share my screen here and we will start with Noble Hill. Uh, this, uh, I'm quoting Stephanie here, who came up with this phrase, which I come back to frequently because I adore this phrase. She described Rosenwald schools as having an austere beauty. If you look at this building, you can see some of the principal features of Rosenwald schools architecture, very large windows to let in lots of light because these schoolhouses would not have originally had electricity. Um, you see here, this is a two teacher school. There's a door, doorway on either side. Uh, those would have led to cloakrooms, which are still there, uh, where dirty outer garments could be kept separate from the education spaces. And originally in this schoolhouse between the two classrooms would have been a series of doors that you could fold, that you could close off to separate the two education spaces or fold back to create a unified space that could be a community center available after hours. And those basic design principles, which are created at the very beginning of the Rosenwald Schools program, persist throughout the entire history of the program. Uh, this is inside the schoolhouse, uh, Valerie and Marion, with the um, portrait of Webster Wheeler, the, who built the schoolhouse. This is an original chalkboard behind them and portraits of Rosa Parks, Dr. King, President Obama. I had never heard of Rosenwald schools until the very beginning of 2015 when I found myself at lunch with an African-American preservationist. And she's the first person to have told me about Rosenwald schools. And the story shocked me. I'm a fifth generation Jewish Georgian. I have been a progressive activist my entire life. The pillars of this story are the pillars of my life. How could I have never heard of Rosenwald schools? So I came home to this desk and I Googled Rosenwald schools and I found that while there were several books on the topic, Aviva's wonderful film had not yet come out, um, there was not a comprehensive photographic account of the program. And so I set out to do exactly that. Um, and over three and a half years, I drove 25,000 miles across all 15 of the program states. Of the original 4,978 schools, only about 500 survived, and only about half of those have been restored. I knew that this was an extraordinary story. It wasn't clear from the beginning how to shoot it visually. And I started by shooting um, the schoolhouses themselves one teacher schools, two teacher schools, three teacher schools. By the end of the program, they're building one, two, and three-story red brick buildings. But when I found out that only half of the surviving schools uh, had been restored, I realized that the, arc that the historic preservation narrative was a critical part of the story. And to tell the, this adaptive reuse, this preservation narrative, I had to get inside. And suddenly I needed permission. And that's how I meet all of these extraordinary people, former students, former, uh, former teachers, preservationists, curators, and I bring their stories into this narrative with portraits. And so I'm gonna tell you the story 
several stories of some of the people that I met along the way. These are brothers, Frank and Charles Brinkley. Frank is actually interviewed uh, in Aviva's documentary, Rosenwald. This portrait of Julius Rosenwald that hangs above the doorway, this is in the Cairo School in Sumner County, Tennessee. It has hung there since this schoolhouse opened in 1923. Brothers Frank and Charles Brinkley attended this schoolhouse. They both went to college. They both went to graduate school. They both became educators. Frank became a high school math and science teacher. Charles became a middle school principal. They have four sisters, all of whom went to this school and all of whom went to college. And these six siblings collectively have 10 children. All 10 children went to college. That legacy may not have happened if it were not for this schoolhouse. This is the Bay Springs School in Forest County, Mississippi. This is the schoolhouse associated with Vernon Damer Sr. Vernon Damer's grandfather donated the two acres of land for this schoolhouse and Vernon Damer was a student in this schoolhouse. When the schoolhouse closed in 1958, the grandfather had been smart enough to build him a reversionary clause and the schoolhouse reverted to Vernon Damer. And he turned it into a center of civil rights activism. SNCC met here, the NAACP met here. And Vernon Damer, who was the head of the NAACP in Forest County, Mississippi, when he drove African-Americans into Hattiesburg to attempt to register to vote, he would have them park behind the schoolhouse so they could not be identified by their vehicles and harassed. As you can imagine, all of this activity drew the ire and attention of the KKK. And on the night of January 10th, 1966, Vernon Damer's home, which is just past the copse of trees on the right of the schoolhouse, was firebombed by the, by the leaders of the KKK. And Vernon Damer stood in the front window of his home with a gun trying to hold the attackers off while his wife Ellie got their children out the back door. And Vernon Damer died as a result of his injuries in that fire. This is Ellie Damer inside the Bay Spring School. Ellie Damer went to a Rose, different Rosenwald school in Mississippi. She went to college, she came back and she taught in this schoolhouse. And when the schoolhouse closed uh, in 1958, because the state of Mississippi had built a larger consolidated, segregated school, do the math, 1958, the state of Mississippi is building brand new segregated schools four years after the Brown versus Board of Education initial ruling. In 1958, when the schoolhouse closes, Ellie Damer is denied employment at the new school because of her husband's activism. And she had to get a job working in a school uh, 35 miles away. And she taught there for the next 21 years. Their son, Dennis, has now re recently completed a restoration of the schoolhouse to turn it back into a community center. But many of these schools have not uh, yet been preserved. And there's an inherent plea in this body of work for preservation. This is the Hannah School across the street from the Hannah AME Church in Newberry County, South Carolina, where the church's graveyard has grown up around the school. These buildings are these spaces, are the locus of history and memory in a community. And when we learn, leave, lose these places, we lose a piece of the American soul. And indeed, I came across schools that had collapsed so recently, like the W.E.B. Du Bois School in Wake County, North Carolina, that they were surrounded by emergency fencing or yellow caution tape. The last story that I'll tell you is of the Hopewell School in Bastrop County, Texas. At the moment this photograph was taken, it was in the final th th uh, throes of restoration. I was just in Austin a couple of months ago to keynote the 100th anniversary celebration of this school that opened in 1922. And this is inside the schoolhouse. The photograph in the center of this image is Sophia and Martin McDonald. It was taken in the 19th century. Both Sophia and Martin McDonald were born into slavery. And upon emancipation, they started raising farm animals. They acquired some land. They acquired some more land. Eventually, they acquired 1,200 acres. And when the Rosenwald Schools program came to Bastrop County, Texas in 1919, the family donated two acres of land for the schoolhouse. Its first teacher was their daughter. One of her students was her daughter, Sophia Williams, shown here on the right, holding up this portrait of her grandparents. 
Her husband, Elroy Williams, went to a different Rosenwald school in Bastrop County. They both went off to college. They became educators. They came back to Bastrop County and had their entire career as educators in Bastrop County. And at the moment this photograph was taken, you see the, um, the uh, plastic on the floor, the plastic sheeting on the floor, the pot belly stove is, is wrapped on the right, the mottled texture on the wall, that's primer. They are in the final stages of restoring the schoolhouse into what is today a beautiful community center and museum. So I'll stop sharing there and, um, and, uh, and turn it back to, uh, to the group here. Uh, but this has been an extraordinary journey and uh, I have been um, uh, honored to be able to work with everybody here uh, in the course of doing this work. Dorothy. Thank you, Andrew. Um, like Andrew, I had never heard of Rosenwald Schools until September of 2015. My husband and I wanted to go see a movie uh, on a sleepy Saturday afternoon. And uh, I looked in the Washington Post weekend section, we live in the DC area, and I saw a review of this documentary called Rosenwald. As I said, never heard of Rosenwald nor of the schools. We went to see the documentary we were blown away. It was so inspiring. I turned to my husband and said, there needs to be a national park to commemorate Julius Rosenwald and the Rosenwald schools. And this campaign that we began all came about because of Aviva Kempner's documentary. And Aviva, will you please tell your piece now? Well, I have to say it came about because there's an inspiring story. And I'm just, uh, I promise you, those with the Noble School, I will be up there because I'm going to be in Atlanta uh, next month. I have a new film that I co directed called Imagining the Indian about Native American mascotting and, you know, especially what they do with the, your uh, baseball team in Atlanta. So I, when I'm there, I'm coming up. And I'm just sorry, Andrew, that you did the photographs after because you did beautiful shots and I would have loved to have used it. First of all, since this film was made in D.C., I'm dedicating what I'm going to say to statehood for D.C. It's about time. We're the only capital in the world without statehood. Dorothy, you wondered how I was going to get it in? I, I knew you would. <laughs> Other thing is, hi, you all. I have this thing about you guys. So I love that we have a Southern topic and I can say love you all. Uh, uh, hi, you all. So it was interesting for me. Yes, my MO is to do underknown Jewish heroes. I have to say, Julius Rosenwald was my most underknown. And while we're on that topic, I think it's because it was 100 years ago. And those most affected by it were uh, in the South and mostly African Americans. And luckily, that's no longer true to the hard work of everyone on the Zoom and hopefully those who are hearing about it. So I was on Martha's Vineyard and there was a talk uh, scheduled about Jews and Blacks in the Civil Rights Movement. And it was Julian Bond, one of my heroes, a SNCC, you know, a leader, and David Saperstein, a reform rabbi who I knew well. And I thought, oh, I, I can't wait to go. Well, I'm sitting there and all of a sudden Julian Bond talks about the Rosenwald schools and Julius Rosenwald and his relationship with Booker T. And so light bulb went off in my, uh, just like, you see this light bulb? Went off in my head. And I said, that's going to be my next film. So that's where I started. Luckily, Peter had, had done a book on, uh, in general, about Rosenwald. And Stephanie had done this great book about the relationship between the two. And most importantly, Booker T himself had done his own slavery chronicles. So I went down to Tuskegee and a, a film was born. I said, I've got to do this. And I'm just gonna mention certain people who are characters in the film that I think are really important. Uh, I'm sorry, the film is not streaming yet. I'm working on that deal, but you all can buy very for $36, a DVD of the film, and it has 30 bonus features and a free study guide. And yes, you still need to have a DVD player. And actually, the word on the street is, um, what do you call it? Flip top phones are back in, and that's what I have. So um, you can be relevant by still having a DVD player. I'm in love with Rabbi Hirsch. This was the man who inspired Rosenwald every Sunday. And back then, 
uh, uh, service, Jewish services were not on the Shabbat, but on Sundays. And people all over Chicago would come hear him. He was originally born in Luxembourg. You should you could read him up. He, he went to the University of Pennsylvania and he played football, a rabbi who played football at the turn of the century. But more, more than anything, he really got what social justice was about. And that's what he taught. The other thing is what Julius Rosenwald did on his 50th birthday. Most people have big parties. He says, oh, I'm going to, you know, he offers different people. He talks to Booker T. What do you want? And Booker T says, because he was already supporting Tuskegee. And he says, how about building, you know, some schools? Now, I think one of the, I would have loved to have been a fly in the wall. So Rosenwald goes talk to Booker T. And he says, oh, well, why don't we just use the Sears? You know, we have these um, framed buildings. Just use that. Well, Booker T says, no, Julius. And by the way, they wrote each other. But I think, Stephanie, you'll have to tell me later. I think they used their second names. I don't think they called each other by the first names. He said, no, we're going to build them here in Tuskegee. And I thought that was brilliant. One of the best presentations I ever did of the film was at the architecture department in Tuskegee because we were imagining and it was so much, so many of the things were built there. And, you know, we talk about green architecture today, and Andrew mentioned it. These, these windows, the way they were placed, the way they were faced, this is green architecture way before anyone's talking about it. And with all this global warming, we, you know we really need it. We're talking about 600,000 students. It's incredible. And, of course, icons like uh, John Lewis, Eugene Robinson, how many people watch MSNBC? Every time you see him, every morning I see it, I said, ah, that's out of a Rosenwald school. George Wolf, who's one of the great directors on Broadway, et cetera, Maya Angelou, it's just incredible. But one thing um, that I think is even more incredible was the fund itself. You know, everyone talks about the Harlem Renaissance. But Chicago actually also had a renaissance in terms of Black um, artists. And Gordon Parks came out of there, one of our great photographers and also a filmmaker. And it was all about being young, gifted, and Black. And the man who, um, actually what Rosenwald did is he stole Embry from the Rockefeller Fund. He had been on the board. And he, he was really impressed with Embry, who has his own background because his father was a preacher and had grown up on this integrated neighborhood. I think it was in Indiana. But in any event, things like the Jacob Lawrence, if you go to the Phillips or MoMA, you'll see the Jacob Lawrence Migration Series was funded by the Rosenwald Fund. And it was split. Phillips bought it. And one of Rosenwald's daughters, Stephanie, you'll have, I'm having a senior moment. Was that your mother-in-law or, or is it your aunt-in-law? In any event, I've contributed to it. But for me, for me, the story that's heartbreaking is Augusta Savage. She was this great sculpturist. She just did the, the, this magnificent piece. If I was back in Washington, I could show you, I have a model of it. I'll lift up every voice and sing. And she did it for the, uh, the uh, what do you call it? The World's Fair. And it was in Queens and people were praising it. She is an artist and I'm a daughter of an abstract expressionist painter. She could not have the money to take it home and it was destroyed. So, you know, we talk about um, relocating or uh, taking away statues that have racist implications. I'm all for that. But I, I have written in the New York Times, you can look it up, and the Ford Foundation did a study on it. We need to restore Augusta Savage's statue that was funded by Rosenwald. And I, uh, it was her first trip to Europe. She originally was supposed to go, and then they found out she was Black, and they didn't fund it. And then the Rosenwald Fund funded it. And we could go on and on in terms of all those people who got Rosenwald grants. But I'm hoping that that uh, statue will be restored. And she had been from the South, maybe there, also in Queens. Luckily, my cousin married a man who's now in the city council and in charge of parks. So I'm going to try to get him to do it. And I always think it should be at Obama's, uh, we could have one of the statues at Obama's library, but he doesn't know it yet. But in any event, what? 
it turns out that someone he's very close to, Valerie Jarrett's mother, uh, grew up in the Michigan Garden Apartments, which is another building that Rosenwald was involved with. It's just been restored. And of course, you have to see the film in terms of seeing that. And it just goes on and on in terms of what his influence was. And, you know, when someone has a vision, you know, on one hand, he knew how to make money, but he really knew how not only to give it away, but to give it in a way that helped people in um, artisans, intellectuals, and to improve their housing, you know, as a product of the Great Migration. And I think that if you see the film, it's not only to say what had happened in the past, but how we in government and personal in foundations. I, mean, I think it is one of the great role models, especially the role model of matching money, because I know that helps me a lot in my filmmaking. I'm always fundraising for my films. Another thing that the Rosenwald family did after uh, Julius was gone was, um, you know, the family was originally from Germany, and uh, that's depicted in the film, is a combination of cousins um, rescued 300 members of their family and they brought them to the States out of Nazi Germany. And I am finally making a film that will be out a world premiere in May called Picking Up the Pieces, colon, A Tale of Two Siblings, My Mother's Story and My Uncle's Story uh, uh, of during World War II, who never talked about it and no longer with us, but luckily gave show of foundation interviews. So in this atmosphere of Holocaust denial, and what I call Holocaust fabrication uh, about Santos. Um, we need to have as many of these stories out to say this is not something that was made up. It really, it, you know, happened. And uh, let me stand up a little. I have a Rosenwald t-shirt, a little, so you can uh, go on the rosenwaldfilm.org website, get a t-shirt, a hat, and the DVD, and um, thank you for joining us today, and I'm honored to uh, be among the rest of you. And the most important thing is the great work that Dorothy's doing. If you know uh, avenues of funding, other groups that can join in, we really need to have a park in Rosenwald's name because it's in the name of the one wonderful work that he did, inspired so much by Booker T. Washington and reading up from slavery. Thank you. Thank you, Av Aviva. And thank you for going into some of the other avenues of Julius Rosenwald's philanthropy. Uh, Aviva was talking about the fellowship program. In that program between 1928 and 1948, the fund awarded nearly 900 fellowships in all different fields, science, the arts, literature, uh, uh, political science. Um, and two thirds, and this was to the highly talented people, mainly young, early in their career. And two thirds of those fellowships went to African Americans, people like um, uh, James Baldwin, Ralph Ellison, Ralph Bunch, Langston Hughes, um, Marion Anderson, Anderson. Yeah. Marion Anderson. Uh, Aviva mentioned Jacob Lawrence, and and that the fund uh, the campaign and it soon will be coming out with uh, a fact sheet on notable Rosenwald fellows and we already have 50 um, people on that fact sheet so stay tuned but I would like to open the discussion by asking a question which is why isn't Ro Julius Rosenwald better known today what was it about him that made him less well known today Stephanie you want to take a crack at that sure um sure Dorothy thank you um and I just want to say, I am the proud owner of one of those t-shirts, Aviva, and I love it, <laughs> white turquoise. And I also have t-shirts from a lot of Rosenwald schools, and it's a very proud collection. I don't have a Noble Hill one, though. I need to get one. Um, Julius Rosenwald had some very specific beliefs that are part of the reason he is not well known today. Julius Rosenwald did not believe in perpetual endowments. So when he set up his charitable foundation in 1917, the Rosenwald Fund, established for the well-being of mankind, um, he stipulated that he wanted the fund to go out of existence, spend down its money, and close its doors within 25 years of his death. So Rosenwald died in 1932. The fund continued um, into 1948, at which point it closed down. 
So today there is a Rockefeller Foundation, there is a Carnegie Endowment, but there is not a Julius Rosenwald Fund. And that was a very specific thing that Rosenwald felt that every generation creates wealth uh, and that that wealth should be used for the needs of that generation, that it was impossible to foresee exactly what the needs would be in 100 years or 200 years. Um, and, and so that is one reason he's not well known. He's associated with a business that does not have his name. Um, and he also was averse to putting his name on things. The Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago, uh, to which he gave $3 million in 1927, uh, the trustees wanted to call it the Rosenwald Industrial Museum, and Julius said, no, uh, I, I don't want my name on it. Partly that was for modesty. Partly it was because he didn't want there to be an implication that his family would support it in perpetuity. Um, but he also, I think it's important to stress that most Rosenwald schools did not have Rosenwald in their name. They were called the Cassville Colored School or the Hope School or the they, they had names picked by the communities that built them. And very, very few of them had the word Rosenwald in them. And in fact, there were many alumni of Rosenwald schools who'd never heard of Julius Rosenwald. And there's a wonderful thing in Aviva's film where a guy, um, I think it's at the San Domingo school, or uh, there was a picture of Julius Rosenwald. And he said, I didn't know who that was. I thought it was the superintendent of schools. So... So we now use Rosenwald schools as shorthand to describe these schools, but um, but they the vast, vast majority of them did not have Rosenwald in their name. Thank you, Stephanie. And uh, Aviva, please. Well, the interesting thing is in terms, you know, it was not only that they got the money, the initial money, but it was the local communities who really raised the money. These schools were, were their schools. They would have, you know, sell canned fruit. They would have picnics. I'm sure there's a whole history of activities that you know from the Noble School. I mean, it's fascinating to me that how much, what a great example it is. It's not only matching, but the continuing, you know, and they became centers, community centers. And I, I wish we in America would have more of that because I think that really makes a difference in terms of people feeling centered in their community. Again, it's a great tale. I, I want to read you something that was uh, written by Frederick Douglass. It's short. Education means emancipation. It means light and liberty. It means the uplifting of the soul of man into the glorious light of truth, the light by which men can only be made free. And today, education is as important as it was back in the early 20th century. Um, Andrew, would you start? I know you've said something about this, but uh, how did the Rosenwald schools help emancipate the African-American children and their families? So there are two um, economists in the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago who have done five studies of Rosenwald schools. And what their data shows is that prior to World War I, there was a large and persistent black-white education gap in the South. That gap closes precipitously between World War I and World War II. And the single greatest driver of that achievement is Rosenwald schools. And, and what's, what's important about that among uh, is that it sets up, helps create the foundation that enables the civil rights movement to happen when it happened. Because the generation of people who became not only the leaders, but the foot soldiers of the civil rights movement to come, come through these schools. Medgar Evers, Maya Angelou, multiple members of the Little Rock Nine who integrate Little Rock Central High, Congressman John Lewis, all went to Rosenwald schools. And so, go ahead, Amiva. Well, we have footage in the film that was taken by Charles Hamilton Houston, who is a very important civil rights lawyer, worked with Thurgood Marshall. And that footage was to prove, you know, the schools were segregated for the desegregation cases. I am so grateful to him for taking that footage because that's what, what we're able, to, you know, to show in terms of the film. And by the way, one of those scholar, uh, one of those, um, uh, what do you call it, economists are in the film and your taxpayers' dollars paid for that study. That's what made me feel really good. I didn't know that 
these guys can sit there, guys and gals, and think up topics that they can do on their off time. So it was it was a fascinating study and proves exactly what Andrew said. I'll just throw I'll just throw in one tidbit. They found out about the Rosenwald Schools program when one of the two economists at his synagogue, Peter Askley, came and talked about his biography of Julius Rosenwald. Right. There are lots of connections. Uh, Stephanie, do you have anything you want to add? Um, gosh, uh, no. Um, okay. I guess uh, I guess one thing that I would that I would just say is it's probably apparent to all of you watching this how much this story and our pursuit of it has brought to all of us as individuals and now as friends. I mean, it's brought us together in a kind of remarkable way. Um, and and I feel personally so grateful for that. Uh, Marion and Valerie? I'm just thankful to be here, a part of this. And it's so <laughs> good. So. <laughs> I was just like uh, Mr. Fowler. Uh, when I first started to work here, this is where I found out about how the Rosenwald schools, I didn't even know this was a Rosenwald school when I was going to school here. And when I started to work here and got into the history of it and found out all of the information about my great uh, my granddad, great granddad, and all this, it, it just started to open up. And when Mr. Fowler came and he gave his speech, it, I mean, so much more was opened up to my understanding about the Rosenwald schools and the fun and how it helped us and how. Uh, it, to me, I just love community. I love unity. I love communities coming together, working together. And it, the way our community came together to have the school built, the same way the community had to come together to have it restored. And it's always everybody together. And that's what I love about it. It's, it's that togetherness, that unity, and the perseverance of us continuing to work on and to, you know, keep it going. And that's what we're here today for, to keep it moving forward. Before we open it up to questions from the audience, I'd like to say that all of us here have been on a journey and I have met every one of you because of that journey. Um, the journey, my personal journey started because of Aviva. Uh, and um, oh, because of Julius Rosenwald. And but my personal journey to <laughs> to honor and commemorate yeah. Julius Rosenwald and the Rosenwald schools and the rest of the philanthropy was because of, of Eva's, uh, it was an aha moment when I saw the documentary. I then met Stephanie shortly thereafter when I was telling somebody about the plans for this campaign. And they said, oh, you have to meet Stephanie Deutsch. She wrote a book. And I met Stephanie. And then some a few years later, I met uh, Andrew through Jordan Tannenbaum, who's now on the board of the campaign at the Holocaust Museum. And I visited, um, golly, um, Marion and Valerie, it's gonna be almost two years ago, it seems like yesterday, I visited the Noble Hill School and Memorial Center in May of 2021, when my granddaughter who went, goes, went to high school in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, graduated. Um, and just a few words about the campaign. We started in 2016. Um, uh, Stephanie is on the board. Uh, Viva and Andrew are on our um, advisory council. Everybody's working hard. Noble Hill is one of the schools that was recommended by the 15 states for inclusion in the park. It's one of the 10 notable schools that's listed in the legislation that directed the National Park Service to do a special resource study. So we're working hard and we will appreciate any support we can get. We put out a newsletter um, and um, we're all dedicated to this. And we hope that in the near future, there will be a Julius Rosenwald and Rosenwald Schools National Historical Park. So I think at this point, um, Suzanne, do we want to... Uh, Take a Can few questions. One more thing. If there yes, are any scholars out there, any kids with that have scholars, we really need a book on, on the fellows. It would be just wonderful because I think it's one. We also need a, mo a, a dramatic movie 
and I think a dramatic movie on both. And I keep on telling people in Hollywood, make a you know dramatic movie, but more importantly, the real scholarship on that. By the way, Woody Guthrie got a Roosevelt grant, and it's one of the funniest applications you'll ever want to read. Right. He was one of the, the as I said, uh, two thirds of the uh, recipients were African Americans, one third were white Southerners and others, and among them were Woody Guthrie, Ralph McGill, who was the editor of the Atlanta Journal Constitution, uh, Lillian Smith, who wrote a book, and Stephanie, I think you had something to say. Oh, I was going to, I was going to make the point about Ralph McGill, uh, yeah. particularly relevant to people in Atlanta. Right. So, uh, Suzanne, um, should we take uh, some of the questions? You want yeah. me to? Yep, no, uh, no, say I that they're 22, 23. Yeah, we're, we're good. We're good. Um, uh, first of all, thank you all for sharing with us. I really appreciate it. I did want to note that somebody wrote in ahead of time just to let everybody know that Norman Finkelstein wrote an illustrated children's book called Schools of Hope, how wow. Julius Rosenwald helped change African-American education. So just to let people know there's something for young. Oh, there you go. <laughs> oh, great. Another book for, for young people. Oh, um, well, if we're showing books, we should be. What the heck did I do with it, Stephanie? Uh -huh. uh, well, while you're looking we, for that, um, somebody should wanted... be showing Stephanie's book. Oh, <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes. I was going to show this book by Claudia Stack um, about Castalia School in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. There are a lot. There, there's a bit of a library of stuff on Rosenwald schools now. So, since we're we're running out of time, I'm going to combine a few questions. Um, somebody wanted to know if the Rosenwald Fund uh, funded all of the almost five thousand schools. Um, and then somebody else wanted to know uh, why this the they're referred to as the Rosenwald schools and not Rosenwald slash uh, Washington schools. Uh, I'll take the second and I'll let, um, well, I, I'll, let me do that. I can sort of, I'm supposed to moderate, but uh, Julius Rosenwald and the Rosenwald Fund contribute partial funding to all of the 5,357 Rosenwald School facilities. They included uh, Rosenwald schools, they included teacher homes, and they included shop buildings. Uh, why were they not called Rosenwald slash Booker T. Washington um, schools. Um, and I think the reason it, it was definitely clearly the idea, the vision of Booker T. Washington. He was trying to build schools long before he met Julius Rosenwald. Um, and they formed this very important partnership. They were both partners and friends. It was, it was Washington's vision. It was Washington's passion, which he imbued in Rosenwald. Uh, the, the program started in 1912, as Aviva said, in honor of Washington, uh, Rosenwald's birthday. Uh, and by 1915, there were about 60 to 80 schools that had been completed or in the process of being built. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Booker T. Washington died unexpectedly. He had bad hypertension in November of 1915. The program, Julius Rosenwald, to his credit and to his honoring, Booker T. Washington continued the program. And most of the schools were built in the 1920s. Uh, and so it was his, Washington's idea, it was his passion, which he transferred to uh, Rosenwald. And it was, as the Coleman women said, it was the persistence, as Marion said, it was the persistence and the passion of Julius Rosemont to see this through, to get these children the education that they sorely needed. Anybody else, please? I was just gonna to add to that, Dorothy, that <clears throat> yes, the vast majority of schools were built after the death of Booker T. Washington. But as I said earlier, the schools were not called such and such Rosenwald school. Um, that was administrative shorthand. Um, the schools had their own names, which were picked by the communities that built them. And actually, in, in 2002, when the National Trust for Historic Preservation, they listed Rosenwald schools as one of the 11 most endangered historic places in this country. And when the fund would have gatherings in uh, Chicago, it was the first time that you would have an integrated you know, the judge, some of the judges themselves were African-American or advisors. 
they would have, um, what do you call it, gatherings. The man who had been under Obama, uh, Homeland Security, his father was... Oh, Jay Johnson. This is a really bad uh, memory day, yes. So, Jay Johnson. Yeah, so... And Loretta Lynch's dad went to a Rosenwald school. Who? Loretta, uh, former Attorney General Loretta Lynch. Her father, her father. Mm -hmm. Went did, to Rosen and North Carolina, yeah. Uh, did the schools have any particular educational philosophy? Did any of the schools uh, teach students above seventh grade? And also for Marion, can share any experiences of what it was like going to a school? Why don't we go Stephanie and then Marion? Um, well, they were public schools, so they followed the standard public school curriculum. Um, one thing that I think is sort of interesting is that um, sort of inadvertently, they ended up adopting um, a piece of sort of Montessori education, which is the schools, um, in, in many, many schools, there would be first grade, second grade, third grade on one side of the dividing door, and then fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade on the other side. So I've heard many people who went to Rosenwald schools talk about how well, when I was in first grade, I heard the second grade kids and I learned a lot from them. I learned a lot from being in the room where the third grade math was on the board and I could pick it up. Um, so that that wasn't an articulated philosophy of the school, but it was a sort of accidental, it was a byproduct of, of, the, of the way they were. Marianne? Marianne? Okay, the same at Noble Hill. When I came to Noble Hill, it, uh, I was I would consider myself fortunate because my mom and dad and uh, other relatives that attended Noble Hill before me in the early years, they had to walk to school. <laughs> they had to bring their lunches from home. Uh, they did. Uh, they had to sit at tables and benches. When I came, there were desks. That we had uh, uh, no inside plumbing but we still was able to get water from a faucet. My, my parents had to, uh, water had to be uh, brought in from a well and they had to drink it out of a bucket with a, with a dipper. All of these kinds of things went on before me. So I didn't have to walk. So I consider that a, a blessing because <laughs> uh, one of my cousins said, older than me, he said he had to walk three miles to school every day. And that, think about it, in the cold weather, my aunts that came to school here, they had uh, to, when they came in, the teacher would have the fire going and a warm a bucket of water, a pan of water for them to warm their hands where they were all so frozen. And I didn't have to go through that, but this was just part of the uh, things that went on when we went to school, at a, went to a Nova Hill school without any inside of uh, plumbing without electricity with the tall windows that were there were built so that the light would come in so that we could do our lessons and writing without a shatter and uh, there were lots of things that happened that uh, I enjoyed because I only went here for three years first second and third grade and those were the years when you think about playing more than uh, having uh, different classes. So that I do remember the older kids helping us younger kids with our lessons. And even though I had more teachers during that time, my parents only had two teachers. Both teachers had, uh, in each classroom, had so many students to do. And all the grades were together. When I came, uh, two other schools had to consolidate into Nova Hill, so that let me be uh, have more teachers, and so the students had more uh, supervised uh, education during that time. But it was fun for me because I was so small, and I, there's just so much I can remember. <laughs> I can remember about it, but I remember the games outside. We played in the woods and made a. Uh, mud pies and we made a house with pine straw and different things that I can remember back then but it was fun for me and we were thankful very thankful that our parents persevered and they struggled to get this done for us to help us to have a better education. Thank you. And as we uh, unfortunately wrap up, um, I'm going to give the question to you, Andrew. Given the documented success in closing educational disparities, can you advance a reason or reasons why the model of Rosenwald schools was not more widely adopted or adapted? 
uh, Roosevelt schools were actually very widely adapted, actually. Um, if you look at um, across the state, take out Missouri, uh, which was an outlier, joined the program late and only had three schools. Um, of the remaining 14 states that were involved in the Rosenwald Schools program, two-thirds of those counties had Rosenwald Schools. And some of the counties that didn't did not have a school-age African-American population. If you take those counties out, 85% of counties in these 14 states had Rosenwald Schools. So it was actually a very, it was a sweeping program. But many of these schools were also built in the, in the, in the teens and the 20s. And so by the time Brown v. Board comes along, it's multiple, you, you've had multiple generations in these schools. And the schools did not all just close with Brown. The response to Brown v. Board varied not just by state, but by individual jurisdictions. Some of these schools were open into the early 1970s. Um, and so uh, I, I think that uh, this was all part of the evolution of education in these Southern states. Great, and thank you. I, I wanna thank Dorothy, Marion, Valerie, Stephanie, Andrew, and Aviva for joining us today. I've put links in the chat for how you can contact all of our speakers and purchase Stephanie and Andrew's books. Uh, as Aviva said, you can purchase her film on DVD and t-shirts on her website. Um, we are working to see if there's a possibility of getting a link to stream um, the movie, uh, but it is not on a streaming oh. service at this moment. Um, I'll be sending out an email uh, later this week that will include all of these links as well as a link to this recording. So please share with others. Um, and don't forget to go to momentmag.com where you can sign up for next week's program about escaping from Auschwitz and our program in two weeks about the Black Jewish relationship and the founding of the NAACP. Again, thank you everybody for- thank, thank you for all your hard work. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Time. And thank you. I thank, thank the audience you. for joining us and we'll see everybody next time. Bye-bye.